All right, so uh, we just went live, and it looks like we're online. Uh, I want to make sure. Uh, can you hear me? No, cannot hear me. Cannot hear me. Let's see here. Are we sure? Yes, you can hear me. Okay, so. So some people can hear me, some people can't. It's probably the people that can't on your system. All right, thanks, Courtney, Victor. Um, so we are going to go ahead and start. And today, hopefully, I'll get to where I can have the full screen. I'm going to try. So do you guys have any questions before we get started? Let me go back here and see how... Bear with me for one second. Yep. All right, so do we have any questions? Yes, we have questions. There's the lag, all right. So let's see here. So any questions before we get started? So uh, while I wait to see if there's any questions, um, I'm going to try to monitor the chat and lecture at the same time and explain things and run my computer. So bear with me if it's uh, a little funky at times. All right, so this is our second lecture. And what I'm going to try to do is um, bring you up to speed on hopefully kind of where you left off in terms of mechanics of materials. Uh, we're going to go through some of the definitions of stress, and then we're going to go through um, uh, more circle and then some basic examples, and I'll try to make a relationship between that and principal stress uh, relationships <clears throat> so that you can find out if things are going to fail. All right, so um, we're going to be using EES, uh, the, um, the, the mosaic folks helped us out they up, upgraded the software for this class and they put the uh, link in the uh, instructions in the folder so you can log into mosaic anywhere uh, using your uncc credentials and you can um, also if you don't have a vpn uh, you'll need to download it and install this i think it's the cisco client um, <clears throat> i actually have it on my computer here i can try to figure out what, what it is I can give you the right name um, yeah Cisco AnyConnect and so uh, if you can download and install Cisco AnyConnect and you can find it by googling VPN uh, with the software um, yes the slides will be on canvas um, I can go ahead and upload those now if you'd like <clears throat> uh, so I'll go ahead and upload the slides so I'm logging into canvas and we'll go ahead and put the slides up here so you guys have these okay I guess it doesn't like that I have it open Let's see if we can force it up there go 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 maybe it doesn't like they were streaming too all right so slides are up there. Any other questions? <clears throat> Let me pull up my thing in. Go back to the studio. Not for me. Yes, slides please upload. All right, Josh, you got it. Fabrizio, Josh, class can thank them. They want the slides. They got the slides. They should be up there now. Uh, if they're not up there, I guess in a couple seconds. Looks like they are up there. <clears throat> so you see we got the slides looks like they're up there all right so you can download and install um, I'll also um, take a copy of that link for you guys I can post it into the chat so you can pull it off there um, So at the end of the class, can you go over the project? Uh, we should have time for that, sure. All right. So 
Uh, EES is Engineering Equation Solver. We talked about it briefly last time. What you can do is use it to do design problems where you can leave stuff as variables and you can see the effect of how you change loads on how, on, uh, how that changes stresses and how that changes the size that you can calculate. Um, if you have any other questions or whatever, just please let me or the TA know. Uh, this is just a quick review. Um, there's really only four loading conditions that we uh, really care about uh, for machine design, and that's the axial load or the normal force. If we have a, a load on an axis, we just have our standard stress force over area equation where P is the force. Um, let me see if I can get <coughs> a laser pointer here. So you should be able to see my laser pointer. Okay. So this is our classical high school physics, statics, mechanics of materials uh, definition of stress, where we have a force over area if we have an axial load. So it's type one, first type, and then we have a shear force, okay, which is either our trivial expression where it's just V over A, that's the average shear stress, or we can actually use the stress distribution equation for transverse shear, uh, where we have uh, tau, which is VQ over IT, uh, v is your shear force acting in the plane uh, orthogonal to the area or in, in parallel with the area and then um, you have uh, Q and Q is your Y hat prime A prime and Y hat is the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of the area above the cross section that you're looking at um, and then A is the area <coughs> above or below uh, where you're taking the plane thickness where you're trying to measure the shear stress. For um, uh, symmetric cross sections that shear stress is the maximum in the middle um, and it's zero um, at the uh, top. Okay. Uh, if you take a look at the um, actual uh, shear, when we use this equation here, uh, this tau is equal to your shear stress distribution. Um, you actually get a uh, prof, you get a constant value. That's what's shown here in purple. Um, but in reality, what you actually get is something that's closer to this green. And so this is a caveat of using this equation. If you have wide cross-sectional areas, this is higher, a lot higher, okay? So smaller cross-sectional areas, this difference is, is not as big of a deal, but there is a caveat that there is a, uh, that this equation under predicts the max shear at the edges of cross-sections if you're using it. So you need to be careful of that. So that covers two of our four, okay? So we have the normal force, we were aware of that. We have the shear stress. Everybody's aware of this equation. Should also be aware of this transverse shear equation. And then we have our <coughs> bending moment, uh, which leads to a longitudinal stress distribution, sigma, which we denote by my over i. m is the applied moment. y is the distance from the neutral axis. And then i is the moment of inertia. If you have a curved beam, you have a different equation for the distribution because you have um, a different stress distribution because of the curvature, and that's m y over a e r minus y. And there's equations for this in your book. This is mainly as a review. So that's the third out of four ways that stress gets into a material, and then the fourth is torsion. And uh, torsion leads to a shear stress distribution where you have your shear stress tau and then you have your uh, applied that the shear stress is due to the applied torque times the distance from the center if you have a um, solid cross section uh, of the material and you divide that by your polar moment of inertia. If you have closed thin walled tubes, you also get shear stress due to an applied torque. But in this case, you gotta calculate your mean area uh, and the thickness of that thin walled tube so you can do this. And these equations show up, they'll show up on your um, FE exam and may even show up on your uh, PE exam. <clears throat> so are there any questions?
All right. So those are our four loading conditions. And so when we talk about designing machines, these are the four loading conditions that we have to concern ourselves with. Axial loads, shear loads, bending moments, and torsion. And that covers all the classes that we of, of loading conditions that are important to us for static cases. <clears throat> the only other loads that we really need to consider are the dynamic loads. All right. <clears throat> Uh, we also have, in a material, we have strain, and strain is where we have a change in length over the nominal length in a dimension. Strain is three-dimensional in a simple longitudinal case. If we apply a load or a force F at the end, we get a change in axial uh, dimension of the uh, um, object that we're loading, and we get a change in the longitudinal direction uh, by delta L. The relationship between those changes in lengths is Poisson's ratio, which is about 0.3 for metals. And then we have um, <coughs> the definition of strain, which is basically delta L over L. <coughs> and we also have definition of shear strain. Shear strain is due to the shear force. And for um, the loading condition, where we have the uh, load that's um, in line with the cross-sectional area, then we get this angle theta, okay? And for, uh, <clears throat> for small angles, we can assume that this angle is approximately theta, which is approximately delta over H. This should be just a review. <clears throat> we need to understand some basic physics of applying loads. Uh, so if we have a load and we apply <coughs> a, if we have a, uh, um, a bar and we apply a load, we're going to get a deflection because of Hooke's law. And that uh, deflection is just the load over the area. And we get the strain that's just the change in length over the nominal length. Uh, if we double the load um, and we have twice the area, so in this case here, what happens if we double the area and we double the load? Well, we get the same strain. If we double the length for the same load, then we get the same strain. Um, so these are some sort of, um, I guess, uh, things to keep in mind when we look at how um, the geometry uh, uh, will affect the overall deflection of, of an object. <clears throat> Alright, so this is our classical stress strain diagram uh, in the region here that's the elastic region. It's governed by Hooke's law and this is where we get elastic behavior or if we apply a stress uh, below the plastic limit or the proportional limit then the, every th the stress is proportional to the strain and if we remove the load, we go all the way back down to zero. Um, this is the elastic region. This is where Hooke's law is valid and where we get elastic uh, behavior. Once we pass the proportional limit, this is where the stress is no longer proportional to the strain. And we get some um, uh, behavior that doesn't follow Hooke's law. Once we exceed the yield stress, then we get permanent plastic deformation and then <clears throat> with that permanent plastic deformation then we would get a a permanent change in in length or a permanent strain um, this is the area where we get yielding and this is going to look different obviously for different materials um, and then after some point of yielding we get this into an area where we get strain hardening Okay, so this is where you have permanent plastic deformation. Uh, and if you remove the load, you'll come down with the same slope. According to uh, the Young's modulus of the material. And the reason we call it strain hardening is if we apply a load, we can go all the way up to this load, which is a higher load, uh, before we actually get another change in um, the geometry. Okay. So in one case, it took this amount of stress, uh, sigma y, uh, to get to where we 
caused a permanent change in the material's dimension. And somewhere over here in the strain hardening region, if we apply a stress, we can go all the way up to that stress and back down without getting a permanent change um, in, <coughs> in length. So there's a question, do we get an equation sheet? I assume you're talking about the tests and um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, sorry that I have these um, out of place here. I'll have to fix that, but um, you can see the location of everything on the graph. <coughs> we do that until we get to our ultimate stress. So this is usually uh, what you'll see recorded for your failure criteria. Um, here or here, depending on what failure is considered as the failure of the material or the permanent uh, deformation. And obviously we remember there's a difference between our true uh, fracture stress, which is here, and that's due to the updated values, uh, assuming you don't have a constant cross-sectional area in your stress strain test. And this is your engineering stress strain, and that comes from not accounting for the change in area as a material uh, next. So this is just a review of your um, materials. Um, when we talk about failure, we talk about failure of either a ductile or a brittle material. And the failure and behavior of the material is tightly related to its behavior in the stress strain diagrams. So um, this is an example of a low carbon steel, <coughs> and this is an example of aluminum. Uh, in this case, the values are uh, pretty similar in terms of the yield stress, um, and pretty similar in terms of the um, failure stress or ultimate strength of the material. Uh, but in this case, uh, with steel, we have a pretty well-defined um, proportional limit, um, but in aluminum, we don't really have a well-defined uh, proportional limit. And so in this case, uh, for the overall length <coughs> to rupture, and in this case it goes to a strain of 0.2, um, we use a 2% strain. In this case, 2% of that range is 0 0.004 or <coughs> 0 0.02% uh, offset. Okay, so that gives us the offset strain for that material. Okay, so there's just a little bit different. If you don't have a well-defined peak, then you, you'll have a 2% yield limit definition for ductile materials, such as uh, low carbon steels, or uh, such as aluminum alloys, or other rot materials. Okay. <coughs> for brittle materials, we get a stress strain diagram that looks more like this, um, where we uh, will be able to continue to increase the load up until some point where it just breaks. Um, Hooke's law is the slope of the material and what's fascinating is that for a certain material comp composition and for different heat treats that we can actually get uh, different um, maximum, I mean uh, ultimate yield stresses out of those different heat treats but we get the same uh, modulus of elasticity. Okay, so this is why it's important when you're considering the design of a material or design of, of something to understand these sort of basic relationships uh, that we have in our stress strain diagrams. <coughs> okay, so I have a note here, strength is affected by the alloying heat treat and manufacturing process, but the stiffness is not. Um, so <clears throat> when we have stress and if we have not yielded the material to its failure point and we go up on the point and we increase the stress to point C and then we remove the stress, the material will follow the slope due to the material property from Young's modulus and then you'll have a permanent strain that you can see here, which is a permanent change in length over the nominal length. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, this is a zoom up of this region and this is what an actual graph would look like for mild steel stress strain. You can kind of see the behavior and you can see the different regions and you can see where these values uh, take place. This is more just for um, your information. If we have aluminum, again we're going to use the 2% offset definition um, in this case. Uh, we have a different 2% off offset that compared to the previous alloy that we used and that's because the uh, wherever the fracture occurs is, um, is different for that material. Um, this is a stress strain for rubber and um, so obviously you shouldn't expect for uh, anisotropic material to exhibit, exhibit linear behavior in, in relationship to force and so um, just when you're designing with some of these materials, these properties actually can be useful um, for us. You can see that the, uh, the stress uh, goes up quite a bit when you try to uh, have strains that offers a lot of resistance so that um, if you compress rubber, you can get different um, properties um, and use it for damping and some other uh, applications. Uh, this would be a material that's used for compression. This is a gray cast iron, just to kind of show that it's terrible in tension and and much better in compression. We also get similar responses for concrete. In this case, you see this tiny little blip up here. Uh, so <laughs> you don't want to use design concrete to be used in tension, really. Uh, but it's really great in compression and um, so the uh, material properties you can be used. It's just an example of a cured test. I thought it was interesting. You see that as you apply the loads uh, to this, you can see the fracture occur at about 45 degrees, which is where your max shear is. Uh, one of the things to keep in con to keep in mind is that <clears throat> when you if you heat something up like particular if you heat steel, uh, you get dramatically different strengths. Um, and so often you'll see um, structural steel will be uh, coated with some sort of fire retardant that will be put on to the interior of buildings. It's all that fuzzy stuff you might see sometimes. And um, that's to prevent the structural, uh, to prevent the steel from heating up uh, in the event of a fire because uh, it can dramatically reduce its strength. So we have a question from Victor, which says, uh, "Are there any are there any processes that can change elastically?" Uh, and I don't really understand that question. So maybe if you could rephrase, uh, I might be able to answer. All right. Um, this is plastic. This is a plastic stress strain, uh, and. I think the point here is you got to know what animal you're dealing with and if you change the temperature uh, for a methacrylate plastic uh, such as uh, acrylic is a polymethyl methacrylate or PMMA uh, that's a material that will exhibit dramatically different um, stress strain behaviors at different temperatures. Are there any processes that can change the, the modulus of the... Now, the modulus of elasticity is, elasticity is a material property. <clears throat> okay, it's a material property that's related to the material composition. Um, and this, I think, might answer your question as well. Uh, you can change the, the, the yield point um, of a material, for example, by changing the percentage of the carbon. Uh, in this case, we have like 0.1% carbon. This might be like a 1018 or 1022 alloy. Um, yes. Yeah, so the the heat the heat treatments don't. Okay. They don't change the modulus of elasticity. So yeah, that's correct. And in this case, the modulus of elasticity is also the same. And what we're changing, we're changing the uh, location of where the um, material yields by the amount of carbon percentage. Okay, 
So actually, you know, high carbon steels um, will yield at a higher uh, percentage things. And this doesn't capture all the other materials, right? This is just stress drain, doesn't capture um, the ductility of the material or um, the total energy absorbed or any of those parameters. Um, we've already talked about what strain hardening is. Um, it's a permanent set. I guess when you load something, if you go past that elastic region, and this, this stress drain diagram actually looks like an aluminum, but if you go past that and you, you uh, yield the material, but you don't fracture the material, and then you remove that load, you go all, all the way down to some permanent set, okay, and we call that a permanent set in the material. And that's actually a design feature. It's one of the beauties of metal is that metal um, is, is a material that um, actually when it starts to yield actually increases in, in its performance, which is pretty remarkable. <clears throat> uh, we have some other uh, properties when we look at uh, stress strain relationships that are important uh, for a material function perspective that's that are this useful uh, there's a modulus of resi resilience and that has to do with the elastic region um, of the diagram uh, it's the area under the curve between um, the elastic limit um, up here that's your modulus of resistance, and so that, that can be a measure of how much um, a material can, uh, how much spring is in a material. And then we have the modulus of toughness, and that can be a measure sort of of how much um, energy the material can take uh, before failure. And these can just be calculated or estimated from <clears throat> your stress strain uh, diagrams. And if you think about the mechanics of it, um, you know, force times distance is the work that's in there, um, and you can establish relationships there. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the sources of confusion when we talk about um, mechanics of materials or material properties is the the stress cube. Um, <laughs> there's really no such thing as a stress cube there's really a stress point in space okay so really like my laser pointer would be like more and more a more accurate prediction of of where we're talking about a state of stress but if we have a body that's subject to bending and torsion and uh, axial and bending and applied loads and that body transmits that those loads to some point inside the body that point inside the body is going to experience a state of stress, okay? And that state of stress, in order for us to understand it, in order for us to do the analysis, in order for us to do design, in order for us to investigate the, the uh, performance of that, that element of stress, that small little infinitesim infinitesimally small element, uh, we we use this abstraction here. We use this representation of this three-dimensional state of stress. Here I've only shown three of the six, but there's actually the same uh, representation on each face where we can have shear in two directions and a normal stress. And we call this a normal stress because it's normal to the surface. And this is a shear in this direction and a shear in this direction. And if you have a, a shear on this face, you have to have a shear on this face that counteracts it because you have to have static equilibrium and those moments have to be balanced. So when you see shear, you also see a shear on the adjacent face um, so that you have static equilibrium. Um, what's not drawn is the uh, sigma y in this direction. We would call that sigma yy. The sigma x out here and the sigma z down here and the associated shear stresses. Okay, and I think the thing that I wanna highlight is that this is not a cube. This is a point in space. But a cube is very useful for us. 
um, in order for us to do the analysis. Okay. Often we um, consider the, the the case where we only have uh, where we have a plain stress or a, a situation where one of the stresses is zero. That might be a situation, say, like the outside of a car body, like a, the or in a car door where the structural stresses are passed through the X and Y direction, but not in the Z or not normal to the surface of that body. <clears throat> so that comes up a lot, and in this class, we'll have a lot of 2D um, states of stress that we'll look at. Um, the sign convention of stress is if we have a positive stress in the positive axis or a negative stress in the negative axis, that those are both considered to be positive and positive is tension, okay? So this would be a positive stress in the X direction. In order to have st static equilibrium, if I have a stress on this side, I gotta have a stress on this side so that it doesn't accelerate, right? The sum of forces has to be to zero. Um, and the same thing here, if w this is also defined as tension because it's pulling the part, okay? If we're pulling the part here in the positive direction with the positive force, we have positive for you are pulling here in the negative direction and with a negative force as defined by our positive normal uh, positive quadrant, the first quadrant. Um, then in this case we have tension, 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 tension. If we change that direction and we have uh, a negative stress um, pointing uh, on the opposite of the positive x direction, then we have uh, compressive stress and that compressive stress is uh, negative so we use that as a negative stress so negative stresses are compressive positive stresses are tensile uh, in this case we have uh, shear the shear convention if the shear uh, makes like Superman where he has his right hand um, uh, lifted out and the, the other one is pulled back okay that's positive shear so may not be the most useful abstraction for you but if we have positive shear here on one face on the right hand um, and we have the left hand moved back that's positive shear another way to think about it is if you're going counterclockwise with with these two um, then that's positive shear or if you, it's more helpful to think of the top right corner you have shear pointing to the top right corner, that's positive, okay? If you have shear pointing away from the top right corner, then it's negative, and those are our sign conventions. They're arbitrary. Um, <clears throat> so, as I said before, it's useful for us to represent an element um, as a cube, so we can talk about the direction of stress of that cube. And in this case, if we have stress um, on a cube, we can actually uh, sum the forces and set them equal to zero. If we sum the forces and we set them equal to zero, then we can resolve those forces by multiplying the shears times the areas times the angle, and we can get an expression um, for any stress in any direction, okay? And these are called the general equations of plane stress transformation. And in other words, using these resolved forces, we can say, well, what are the forces at a different orientation? And then we can solve for those. And that would be your sigma x prime, sigma y prime, and tau xy prime. <clears throat> so let's see here. All right. All right. And so this, um, this is an example of the transformation equations. We don't use these. I don't, I've never used these in practice. I've never used these to uh, resolve stresses because it's, it's way easier to use more circle. And in this case, um, this, this is kind of, I like to tell people the whole story. So this is where more circle comes from and we're gonna get there in a second. Um, this is where the transformation equations come from. Basically, if we take 
some state of stress on an element inside some object and we represent that state of stress according to our directions x and y like we like to do in the Cartesian plane and then we say well what would be that state of stress on a different plane then we can use these equations here and solve for what that state of stress would be at that different plane at that angle theta Okay, if we do that, um, we can solve for the state of stress at any plane given a state of stress at a plane. <clears throat> and these are our transformation equations. Okay, and it's all just done by looking at the statics and, and doing all the bookkeeping to resolve your forces in x and y and represent them as a function of theta. And that way you can change theta and you can find any other stress state for sigma x, sigma y, and tau x, y prime. Okay. Um, this is an example. This actually came from the FE review book. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, given uh, this, this state of stress, the question is, what is the state of stress at 30 degrees? So all you'd have to do is plug and chug. Uh, pay attention to your signs. If you change your angle by 90 degrees, you're going to flip the sign here and here, and that'll give you the stress for sigma y on the other face. Okay, so you can do that. You can go through the math and you can calculate, given this state of stress, find this state of stress. Okay, so in this case, we went from 80 megapascal, 80 megapascal in compression. This in this orientation to 25.8 megapascals in this orientation and this on the X face as we defined it. So um, we can do this, we can use the uh, other equations and just work out that. So this example is going to be in there for your review. We are not going to use the transformation equations but I think it's important for you to understand where they come from and how you would use them. <clears throat> So uh, we learned in calculus that if we wanted to find the minimum or the maximum of anything we can, uh, of any function on an interval, that we can take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So if we wanted to find where we would have the maximum stresses, uh, which we'll call our principal stresses, uh, which involve our principal normal stresses and our principal shear stress. So if we wanted to find what orientation or what angle theta would result in the element having the maximum stress on the normal faces, then we can take the derivative of theta with respect, we can take the derivative of our sigma x equation with respect to theta and then set that equal to zero and that's the way we would find the maximum or minimum of that function. So if we do that we get an expression that we can use then to solve for theta and if we plug this theta into these equations we can get rid of the theta term so if we solve for theta and we have enough equations we can plug it in and then get rid of it and that way we can solve for sigma 1 and sigma 2 and these are called our principal stresses and you see down here this is the summary and this is actually the equation for Moore's circle uh, where this is your center <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my pointer I'm sorry about that this is your this is your center of your circle and that's your radius okay um, So, we can also do this and we can find what angle theta will give us the maximum shear stress. So we take that same, we take the function of the shear stress tau xy, and we take the derivative with respect to theta, and we set it equal to zero. That way we can find what theta will give us the max shear stress. And if we plug, if we solve for that theta and then we plug it into our uh, tau xy equation, then we get our tau max 
uh, in plane uh, shear stress, and that's shown here. Okay. So to summarize, um, when theta is equal to theta p, which is the angle of the max principal stresses, we get our principal stresses here, sigma 1 and sigma 2, and we have our shear stress that's 0. Okay, So this would be the state of stress at some angle theta p uh, for this element. <clears throat> our shear stress is 0, and all we have are our principal stresses. Now this is the plane stress state, and that's where one of the stresses is zero. Okay, and that's where, uh, in this case, sigma three would be zero. But um, not not everybody uses that notation. But for for now, that's fine. The point is that we have two stresses that we can solve for, and then there are the minimum and the maximum. On this case, if we have theta is equal to theta s, then we have for our transformation equations, an orientation where we have the max shear, okay? And at that orientation, for the max shear, we can find that our shear stress is sigma one minus sigma two, where sigma one is the largest stress, sigma two is the smaller of the stresses, and it's that over two, and we find that sigma, uh, or sigma x and sigma y, should be sigma x and sigma y, that this is the average stress on the faces. So we have two situations that we can represent a state of stress of an element in an object that's been loaded by some loads. Okay, so if we go all the way down and we can represent that state of stress on that element, then we can turn, we can find our principal stresses. And these are the stresses that will tell us uh, the principal stress, principal stresses, which include the principal normal stress and the principal shear stress. And those will give us our max state of stress for the, those loading conditions, which we can then relate to the failure criteria, which is very important. Um, this is just a summary of what I just wrote. Um, this is Moore's circle. And so instead of using the transformation equations, uh, Otto Mohr, who's a German engineer, figured out that he could represent those transformation equations and uh, relate them at, as a circle, where you have um, basically your equation of circle a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And if you do that and you use that equation, then you can actually draw the stresses at any angle. And <clears throat> if we use our relationships here for a state of stress, sigma y, uh, and sigma x and tau xy, this would be plane stress, then we can actually take those states of stress and plot them on a circle. Um, sigma x would be the stress on the x face, and then tau xy would be the shear on that face. That shear has to be balanced by the shear on the y face in the opposite direction, and this would be our other face. And so um, we can find a state of stress here, and we can actually plot that in a circle. The center of the circle is the average stress here, sigma x okay, plus sigma y over 2 gives us this center point here. This distance from the center point to sigma x is sigma x minus sigma y over 2. And this, is just, this just becomes a triangle here where we have the radius and we can calculate the radius. And if we know the radius, we can actually find the max shear because you can see that the max shear is the same as the radius, assuming I drew a perfect circle, which we see we, I didn't. But assume for the sake of argument, we have a perfect circle. Well, this distance from here to here is our radius. Okay. So, and that distance is the same magnitude as the max uh, shear for this circle. Now, this is not the maximum shear because we actually have a stress over here at zero, which makes this, gives us a small Mohr circle here. And then, then we have a larger Mohr circle that goes around there. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But this is our max m-plane shear. And that's how we use Mohr circle. 
Uh, these are the steps to drawing more circles. There should be a review. I think you've had this in your mechanics of material class. You can follow these steps for a given state of stress. Find the center, find the radius, find the circle points. This is an example here where you have a state of stress, where you have a compressive stress due to these torsional loads and bending moment. Um, I mean, sorry, where you have a torsional load due to this applied moment, and then you have an axial load. Well, that gives you a compressive stress, and it gives you a shear stress that you can calculate using those four states of stress at the beginning of the lecture that I showed you. And you can have um, sigma x as 12 ksi, sigma y is 0, tau xy is uh, 6 ksi. Using these expressions, we can find the center of the circle, okay, which is the sum over 2 of the stress on the different faces, and that gives us the center here at minus 6 ksi. And then um, <clears throat> once we have that, we can calculate sigma 1, sigma 2. So sigma 2 is going to be the center of the circle, which is sigma c, uh, minus r. Okay, so that'll be over here. And then sigma 1 is going to be the center of the circle plus the radius. Okay, sigma 1, center of the circle plus the radius. Sigma 2, center of the circle minus the radius. Okay, so as long as we can get the center of the circle from the state of stress, we can find the points. And we know that the magnitude of the shear is equal to the radius. And so instead of us doing all those transformation equations um, to relate the different states of stress, um, more made it really easy for us to use this circle analogy. <clears throat> and I'll have to move this over here and fix that. All right. So then, based upon this state of stress, we can actually find our principal stresses. And if you look here, we have sigma 1 and sigma 2. Sigma 1 is 2.49 ksi. Sigma 2 is minus 14.5 ksi. And these principal stresses occur at 22 and a half degrees um, relative to this state of stress here. Uh, the reason that this is important is because you you can look at this and you can say, oh, well, you know, I have 12 ksi, I have 6 ksi, so you know my stress is going to be less than 12. Well, that's not the case, right? So we see that once we use more circle and we transform this state of stress on these faces we can find our principal stress sigma 1, which is pretty low, and then we can find sigma 2 is actually higher than any state of stress that's applied. Okay, So that's why we have our failure theory and our failure criteria that are based upon these principal stresses. Um, okay, um, This is another example. In the last example we said what are the principal stresses. Um, this is the principal normal stresses. And these are the maximum in-plane shear stresses. And this is uh, another example where we just use the same definitions of the circle. Now, in your book, and I uh, apologize if this is difficult to read with my tablet scratch, but um, we really have a state of stress on an element, <clears throat> which is what I had showed earlier. Okay, So if we go back. We take a look here, all the way back to where we started, and we say, oh, we have this element right here, okay, this general state of stress on this element. Well, we can represent that state of stress as a tensor, a stress tensor, and that stress tensor looks something like, looks like this. This is the stress tensor, okay? So we have our X face normal stress, Y face normal stress, and Z normal stresses, and then we have our uh, uh, face, direction, shear, face, direction, shear, uh, tau, face, direction, shear, and this, in this state here. So when we have a system that's loaded, if it's loaded in a three-dimensional state of stress, we can represent that three-dimensional state of stress with a stress tensor. That stress tensor, if we want to find um, the way that it acts on the um, principal directions, um, this would be the direction where we have a principal plane, and it actually is equal to um, the, it's a, the, the stress, which will be the principal state of stress in this orientation. 
Now this, if you remember from linear algebra, <clears throat> is a, an eigenvalue problem, which is in the form of ax is equal to lambda, I, lambda x or lambda ix. And what we can do is we can uh, subtract this from the right hand side from the left side and we get an ax minus lambda i and this is your standard eigenvalue problem and so for the non-trivial solution we have to have that the determinant of this is equal to zero and so if we take this matrix where we have this sigma x and we drop the second subscript because it's redundant minus sigma, the sigma here would be the state of the principal stress that comes in the principal direction. And if we um, solve this problem and we, we take the determinant of this and we set it equal to zero um, because this must be a singular matrix um, in this eigenvalue problem, then we get an expression that looks like this, okay? And this gives us sigma 3, sigma 2, and sigma 1. And um, this is our stress function here. Um, and that gives us um, the principal stresses in three dimensions. So this is the three-dimensional way. And this is how the author, uh, Dr. Norton, takes this <coughs> and introduces a three-dimensional state of stress. Well. Um, the coefficients in this case are C0, C1, and C2. These are called stress invariants. Um, that means the coefficients don't change um, no matter uh, um, uh, what the state of stress is. They, they remain the same uh, form. And you can calculate these. And then you can actually solve using a closed form solution for the cubed roots. Uh, or you can use a computer and type something like roots in MATLAB. Uh, if you have this case, we can find the principal stresses from the, either the transformation equations, Mohr circle, or solving the eigenvalue problem. Okay. So if we solve the eigenvalue problem, we get the same expressions that we had for maximum in-plane shear stresses. We can solve for sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. <clears throat> and historically, uh, the notation is sigma 1 is always your max stress. Uh, sigma 2 is uh, between your max and your minimum stress and sigma 3 is always your minimum stress. You can also find your principal shear stresses from the difference in the principal normal stresses. Okay, And I'll Although it looks that this will always be less in reality, you can actually have a, a larger uh, shear. And in fact, um, sh the shear plane is, is at 45 degrees to the um, principal plane. If you have one of these values that's zero, then we have these equations for uh, sigma one and sigma two where we can find those um, principal stresses. All right, so this is an example of your book, from your book, this is example 4.1. It says if we have a biaxial stress element, as shown here in figure 4.2, this is um, where sigma x is 40,000, PSI, sigma y is 20,000 PSI. It says use more circle to determine the principal stresses. Um, I believe this is supposed to say figure 4.4-5. <coughs> But in this case, we have a stress cube here. We have a sigma y, and that's a compressive stress here. And we have sigma x. This is our x, y, z orientation. And you can see that the sigma y acts in opposite direction of sigma of the y direction, so it's negative sigma y here. 
that's the negative value, that's the uh, x coordinate, and then we have our y coordinate, which is in shear, which is the shear place. So we can put this at point D, okay? And then we have sigma x, and then in this case we're in tension because we're pulling away. And then we have tau xy um, here, and we can find our sigma x value and our tau xy, and that allows us to then find the center of the circle um, and find the radius because um, we have all of those values. These are the steps that are outlined in Norton. I encourage you to go through these. And it's important to note that um, in this case, we calculated uh, a sigma one, which is all the way over here. And we have a sigma two that's here, but we actually have a sigma three, which is zero. Okay, so sigma one is greater than sigma two, which is greater than sigma three. And this is the notation that's used to describe that. Okay, so we have our maximum principal stress, our middle value of principal stress, in this case it's zero, because we have a plane stress, we don't have stress in the third dimension. And then we have sigma three. Okay, so the equations that we just described are valid, and we have three shear stresses. We have a shear stress for this Mohr circle, which is tau two, three, that would be the sigma 2 minus uh, sigma 3, and that's this value here. And then we have the sigma 1 minus sigma 2 value here, and that's our other principal shear stress. And then we have uh, tau 1, 3, which is our maximum, maximum in-plane shear stress. You always need three more circles, okay? Now if we go back to these equations, these match up what we have right here, okay? And this is where they show up here. This is a big deal for you to understand that there's always three circles, okay? There's another example in your book, and in this case we both have two compressive, I mean we have two tensile stresses, okay? And so it's very easy if you have this state of stress to underestimate the amount of stress. Okay, so we'll have this state of stress here. We can take this face and we can map the, uh, point A. We can take our sigma x here and we take our tau xy, we find this point. We can do the same thing, find our sigma y and our tau xy at this point. Then we can find the center of our circle, we can find the radius, we can find the max shear. But if we calculate this as tau one, two, this is not the maximum shear that this element is experiencing. Okay, because we actually have a third, a second Mohr circle here, and then we have a third Mohr circle that encompasses the entire thing, and that's shown over here. Okay, so you always need th three more circles to get your maximum in-plane shear stress. Okay, I can't stress that enough. Um, and then if you forget, you can always go back to these equations here, right, and know that you always have three states of stress. If one of them is zero, you still have uh, three principal shear stresses, okay? All right, so at this point, I'm gonna ask if there's any questions. Uh, I know we had a question earlier if we could go over to project, so I'm happy to pull that up and kind of talk through that a little bit. Um, I know that you guys have, uh, a number of teams have been formed. I'm gonna send the teaming assignments out later tonight for those that don't have a team so you can get started. Um, obviously you can get started even if you don't have a team, uh, but I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so are there any questions about this overview? If not, I will go over the project in more detail. Please have your questions ready. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to pull up the project.
So there we go. There's our project. So Joshua Smith would like to know if the project is for a real company. The answer is yes. Um, but this is an old project. This was done uh, a while ago. Um, and it was done by a licensed professional engineer and some students. It was not me. It was a colleague of mine at a different university. Um, and this was a project that they implemented and became a design project. So this is certainly a, a real project for a real customer that had a real problem. Um, and it encompasses most of the elements that we're going to be going over in the class. Um, and if you are a, uh, yeah, chances are that you guys, have, like everyone in the class has used this product. Um, very high likelihood that you have used the product that came off this machine. Um, all right, so I'm going to walk through this, and um, I guess if you got, if you guys want, we can go over to uh, over to Hangouts. And while I wait for you to respond, I'll just go ahead and start talking. So in this case, I think uh, I've sent the video. I think you guys got the video in the link last time. I'll have to add the links to the site. Okay. Um, so this is a case where we have a two-shot die. And the mold will close. And the first shot is going to go on this side over here. Um, let me uh, pull up my pointer focus, see if that helps. Okay. All right. I don't want the zoom. All right. <clears throat> so this part right here is the first shot and um, this is the mold and on this side we have a cavity so the cavity is the part that spins so when it comes over here on the first shot it fills it up with plastic and then it spins 180 degrees and comes over here where we have a different geometry and then it fills up that second shot uh, where there's uh, still room for the material to grow because we have a little bit different size geometry okay and so the design problem is just to design this such that uh, we can turn this around with the limiting case. All right. And so what we have to do is design the die rotating mechanism to be folded into the machine by any number of dies that can be bolted. Okay. So we're going to have to design um, this, um, this rotating part such that we can bolt on dies. Okay. Uh, you can assume that the largest die is a solid block of steel to calculate the uh, mass, which you'll need um, to calculate the deflection. And you've given dimensions here of the height, the width, and the depth. And that's along the axis of rotation. So. Um, it has to rotate 180 degrees in 800 milliseconds or 0.8 seconds. It'll then remain stationary for a little bit of time and then it'll rotate it again for uh, and it has to finish that in 0.8 seconds. So it's going to go and take a shot, rotate, take a shot, rotate, take a shot. Um, yeah, we have to design the components so that it will never fail uh, for at least 10 years. Okay, so that'll give us the fatigue life calculations okay um, so um, this part of it gives you enough information to calculate the torque okay because we know how how um, we know the mass and we know how fast it needs to go and so um, what that's going to get into is uh, let me go over here. Let's 
Let's see if I can move this. Alright. Bear with me one second as I figure out what screen I'm on. you guys can see that okay so <clears throat> we we're given the mass here all right so we're told we have this die Boy, that yellow thing is annoying let me turn that thing off We're told that we have this die, and it bolts on some turntable somehow. And you know we don't know how big this is. This is for you to define. But what we do know is this thing, and however much mass is here, however much mass your mechanism is, right? We have the uh, all these devices, right? And you have an overall mass as an estimate okay well that mass has to rotate around this axis in 0.8 seconds okay so what that'll give you is it'll give you a function in time of the mass and how it has to accelerate and so what's typically done in practice is people will uh you can start here with an acceleration over time and you have, so let's say you have a constant acceleration because you're going to have some form of some some motor right that gives you some torque and that torque for a given you know we have the sum of the torques is equal to i alpha okay you got to find that acceleration that's going to come from that torque and you got to relate that to the Time. So you got to accelerate and then you got to be able to stop and that time has to be 0.8 seconds. Well this will give you your acceleration, it will give you your alpha and then you can go down here right? and the derivative of the acceleration is the I mean the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration so if you have the quadratic here, you're going to have <coughs> a velocity that's increasing, right? That's a quadratic term. Then you have a constant, <coughs> so then you have a linearly increasing uh, velocity. Well, you have a, a zero acceleration there, so it's constant, right? And then you have a deceleration in your velocity profile. Which is going to have to go back to zero. <clears throat> um, and then you can relate that to the position that it has to travel in time. This is wrong um, here. So I did this wrong. Basically, if you integrate here, acceleration you're going to have a velocity here that's quadratic because this is an x term and then this is a constant term so you're going to have a linear velocity because you have constant acceleration <coughs> and then you have your uh, deceleration we'll have to come back to this this I'm I'm butchering this the point is that the accelerations for your uh, mass will tell you what torque you need, okay? So that's what, what we gotta sort out. So that's at this point here. 
Yeah, I mean, you, the, the, the density of steel is going to be about the same, whether it's 1018 or not. Okay. So, um, when the die is hung, it cannot deflect more than a thousandth of an inch. Okay. In either the vertical or axial directions at any point on the die face. Okay. So, you're going to have to take a look at how much weight is hanging off the, the bolt pattern. And you're going to have to look at the... Um, analyze the deflection. So obviously the deflection in the axial direction is probably going to be through the shear, but then you have this mass that's hanging out uh, over here on these bolted joints, and so it's also going to apply a bending stress um, and have a deflection in that direction as well. So you're going to have to sort out that and make sure that it doesn't deflect more than the thousandth of an inch in either the vertical axial directions um, and then vibrations of the die should be minimized to avoid stopping, okay? The length of the assembly should be kept as short as practical, okay? So we don't want to make some very, very long um, <clears throat> artifact here that'll be spinning. We want to keep it compact. Um, the rotation will be driven by a servo motor, okay? And that servo motor is going to follow that trajectory profile. And then you can use plane or roller rolling bearings, okay? You'll have to pick the size of the motor based upon the acceleration that you need to get that mass to move where you want it to go and the time you want it to go. And you have all semester to do this. It's plenty of time. Um, and we'll go through it and try to make sure we have enough time to discuss it. We'll have design reviews. Uh, you'll get to see other people's work as well, um, which will help you with yours. Um, okay, and again, this kind of comes back, like once you estimate the moving mass, then you get the dynamic forces, and then you can figure out what the torques you need. Um, so. We have three phases of design. This is the, the, the phase that you're in, where you and your team really need to define the problem. You have to come up with some concepts. And what you're going to find is um, that there's a lot of things you don't know, uh, and you have to come up with some answers. Okay, And this is going to be similar to what happens when um, you design anything that you've never designed before and most engineers you know when we graduate from school we haven't really done a whole lot of real design and even when we get our job and even after a few years it's possible we could get to where we're, we're constantly designing new things okay so the first part of it is like hey let's get an estimate of the mass uh, let's find out how much power we need to move that mass around an axis that's very straightforward that's all the classes kind of before those. We're not really talking about fatigue or um, definitions. We're just trying to get the, the kinematics and then we'll get the servo profile. Uh, then we need to do the structure, just start to model it, okay? And we need to model it dynamically as well so we can get the dynamic forces, okay? So we have to do the kinematics and the kinetics to approximate the forces and power levels. Okay, so we have a whole month to do this, um, and so you, you do need to get started uh, right away before your first design review, but if you look at the way that I've graded it, the design reviews I don't have graded heavily. It doesn't mean you can dismiss them because I'll certainly remember if you are being dismissive, but it, it is that like we can have, there's space to learn. Okay, you certainly need to do the work, do the homework, uh, be prepared for the tests, uh, but for the design problem, we're going to walk through it and, you know, you need to do as much as you can and kind of get stuck and then we can discuss it. Um, you know, you're going to have to transmit the power from the motor. This is the second phase. So you're going to have to design the key and the shaft of that motor against fatigue loading. Uh, there's a question here. So as part of the design process, will we have CAD models? No, I will not give you CAD models. You can make them if you want they are not a requirement. You can have sketches and you can have pen and paper designs. Uh, this is for you to get to where you have, you have like 99% of the whole thing designed on paper and with EES and software 
or spreadsheets or whatever, and you have confidence that you can go and start ordering hardware. Okay, CAD models can certainly be helpful, and in fact, you can use your CAD model to get more accurate representations of the actual masses and the mass distribution, and you can validate your static analysis if you want to with uh, SolidWorks, Force, or SimFlow, or whatever it is. But it's not a requirement because I'm not really going to teach you how to do SolidWorks design, and I'm not going to really, um, I, I want to know that you can actually go through the engineering design process. Okay. Um, so once we do that, then we're going to have to design a gear set so we can transmit that uh, power and define it and make sure that we have, that we, uh, that we can last 24-7 for 10 years without fatigue, failure, which is 90% of the failures in machines is fatigue failure. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Uh, and then we want to like design. Then we want to design a, a spring and specify the bearings and the fasteners and sort out all the rest of the details. Okay. And so um, that's the the schedule. Are there any questions about that? I think the main thing is to just get started and kind of figure out what what it is you don't know, what it is you need to know, and where do you need to make decisions. Um, and I've given you more than enough time to do that. I haven't given you enough time to not work on it, though. Are there any other questions? If not, I will sign off and send out the remaining teaming arrangements. Well, uh, feel free to email me if, or if you want to schedule time. I have office hours again uh, tomorrow. I mean, when, let's say, I have office hours again on Monday. The TA has office hours on Friday. Uh, he has sent a Google link that you can uh, just click on and sign in. And uh, look forward to um, going through this process with you guys. I'm gonna, I already uploaded the slides. Make sure you review them and understand. And add, please let me know if there's something that's unclear or we need further clarification I can take a little bit of time at the beginning of each class to answer some of the questions uh, that you might have uh, if there's no other questions I'll say goodbye for now and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week and I will see you on Monday